Today's reading is from Acts 6, from verse 1 to 7. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up the preaching. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of, God, of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Porcherus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning again, church. Um, thank you, Catherine. We are uh, back in Acts, and I'm very excited to get into this text with you today. We're actually going to look at this same text next week. Today will be uh, kind of a transitional sermon for us from the Upper Room Discourse uh, to Acts and kind of reintroduction to what's happening in Acts, but also um, a couple specific calls for us as a church as we head into this next season together. Mark's been saying it. If you were here uh, before 11 o'clock, which was like 5% of you, then you, you would have you seen, thanks for the chuckle over there, appreciate it. Uh, you would have seen uh, a prayer up on the screen. So it, we, we want to create this space where before the gathering, if you, if you have 10 extra minutes to come and, and just get your heart right before the Lord. I know today there's cookies out there and booths and everything makes it hard. Um, but... We had this prayer up, our prayer for today, which is that Jesus would lead us into his vision for his church. Jesus has a vision for his church. Jesus, like almighty God, the one at the, at the right hand of the Father, the one who sent us his spirit, like the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of Jesus in, in the book of Acts, like Jesus has a vision for his church. He has a reason for which he's planted his church, not just in the world, but in this city, like in Vancouver. And, and he's chosen us. He, Acts tells us that, that he's chosen, determined the times and places that we would live. Like he has picked us to be here now as his people. And, and I just feel there's a couple things as we come out of the upper room discourse that the Holy Spirit is just saying, hold, hold on a second. Don't move by that too quickly. And so I want to talk about two specific things as we go uh, into this today. But just before we, we get into it, um, my job up here on Sundays with you, my job is just simply to, to, to try to unpack or expose what the text is saying. My, my job is to give you what, what, the, what the word of God is saying. What I don't want to do is, and, and what you shouldn't be, uh, I know what you don't want, and, 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 and what we need to avoid is, is sitting around discussing our own opinions. You don't need my opinions. I don't want to give you my opinions on things. You don't need the wisdom of the world. You don't need lofty speech. You don't need a really like polished delivery of a talk. You don't need that. Like what you need, what I need, what we need as Jesus people is we need the word of God. The word of God is, is sufficient, it is authoritative, it is living and active. And it is able to give us everything we need so that we will be competent and equipped for every single thing that God has called us to. So, so we're here to sit under the word of God. But, but here's what that means. It, it means that when I say things... You, you, are, you are free to discard anything that you know right away. Hey, that's just Matt's opinion. You're free to discard that. But what you're not free to do, and I'm speaking to the Christians in, in the room. If you're not a Christian, we're glad you're here. But this is just to the Christians for a second. It, what you're not free to do is discard what God says. 
And so when I say things that you know are found in Scripture and you know are true according to the Word of God, then, then what we need is, is actually a response of faith. Faith is not just believing that it's true. It's not just trusting it like intellectually. Faith, is, faith without works is dead, James writes. It, 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 we, our faith is dead unless we act on what we hear. And so what I want to ask for, what I believe the Spirit wants to do in us this morning, I, I believe he wants to empower radical acts of faith in his church, not just today, but in this season. And so I just want to pray for us before we get into this, um, that, that we would be like bold and courageous and have that warrior spirit to step out in radical acts of faith based on what God has to say to us through his word. So let, let me pray for us. Father, uh, just like Mark prayed a second ago, I want to echo it. We want you to come and have your way with us. We want you to come and lead us. We are not here. We, we have seen enough of what human beings can do. We, we want you to express through your church what only you can do in this city, what only you can do in this world, what only you can do in our lives. So Lord, we don't come to you today as capable and resourced and uh, competent people, independent. We come to you as children with our hands open and we say, Dad, would you feed us? Would you give us what we need? Would you make us faithful to your call? Would you change us? Would you transform us? Would you ignite a fire in this church like a Holy Spirit, a, a move of the Holy Spirit that would be like fire in us, like consuming fire, Lord, where we could not help but proclaim your gospel to those we love and know in this city, where we could not help but respond to you in obedience, where we could not help but wake up in the morning, fall flat on our faces and cry out to you, or we could not help Lord, but to open your word because we're hungry, we're starving. So forgive us, Lord, for all the other appetites that we've just been stoking for so many years. We're so distracted and we're used to being so stimulated in specific places that our minds and our hearts and our appetites physically. Lord, I ask instead that today, Spirit, come and make us alive in our spirits. Come and make us alive in our spirits. Come and speak to that place in us, Lord, that you, that you, you have made acceptable as your own dwelling place. That place of holiness within us, made alive through Jesus. Come and wake your church from its sleep, Lord. Not just here, every, all across the city, come and wake us from our sleep, Lord. We love you. Help us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting moving from the Upper Room Discourse to Acts because in the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus is giving us his vision for the church. And in Acts, what we see is we see the, the early church taking her first steps into that vision. Jesus has said in the Upper Room with his disciples, and we've studied it over the summer, he said, you know, persecution is coming, trouble is coming, you will have sorrow. But the, but, the, but the message of Jesus, the vision of Jesus for his church wasn't like a negative one. It was a really incredible and beautiful one. He said, I'm going to send you my spirit. I'm going to fill you. He's going to come and counsel you and guide you and convict you and equip you and fill you. And it's going to be better for you that I go and he come than if I were to stay with you. And as we come to, to, as we step back into Acts, Acts chapter 6, we're seeing that, that the early days of the church are unfolding just like Jesus said they would. Rampant persecution, intense pressure, high stakes, and yet the church is alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, like, we're not going to go into details on this text today. We'll look at it again next week. But what I really want us to see is the books, is the verses that book end. Our text today. So Acts 6, 1, Acts 6, 7. In Acts 6, verse 1, we read this. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number. Church, these days are days of persecution, days of intense pressure. And what do we see? The disciples of Jesus are increasing in number. Verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. 
When we, when we step into Acts 6, the church is already well over 5,000 people. And it's, it's growing rapidly. And it's so important to see this because what it means is that Jesus has a vision for his church. Jesus has a design for his church. And just like Jesus told us, he is the one who builds his church. And that's why when the world comes against the church, it doesn't actually fold up. It doesn't actually roll over. It doesn't actually keel over and die. The church comes alive like never before. When the pressure is increased on the people of Jesus, when the cost of following Jesus becomes real to us, the Holy Spirit is able to take the weak and dependent and limited men and women of God and birth all kinds of new things in them and through them. And look, right now, like I'm hearing a lot in Christian circles, I'm hearing a lot of doom and gloom, especially, weirdly, from older Christians. Like people have been around longer. They seem to be the most, sometimes, not often, but sometimes the most pessimistic. Like we're full, like we're looking around at the world and we're, we're just seeing the chaos and the insanity and the darkness and the corruption and it just feels like it's completely lost. It's getting worse than ever. And so a lot of people are, are, like, are like ringing the alarm and saying, hey, the church is gonna have to move into survival mode. Can, can I just tell you that that has nothing to do with the biblical vision of the church? Nothing. No, look, look at this text, Acts 6, as we, as we drop back into it. Despite persecution, sin, all kinds of conflict, even within the church, like we're going to talk about next week, the church isn't just growing, it's thriving. In this church, what we're seeing, like, like make no mistake about it, when, you're, when we're told the church, like Jesus left sent his Holy Spirit, the gospel began to be preached in the city. 5,000 came to Jesus over kind of two gatherings, but they're continuing to grow between. Now we're told twice in our text that the disciples are increasing, the disciples are multiplying. What this means is that through the church, the Holy Spirit is storming the gates of hell. Like, this is not defense the church is playing. This is offense, Through the church, we see the Holy Spirit setting captives free by the thousands. And it won't stop in Jerusalem because Jesus' vision for his church includes the whole world. It's why in Acts 1 verse 8, before Jesus left, he said this to his disciples. You will receive power. Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The the vision Jesus gave to his disciples was always bigger than what they could fulfill in their lifetimes. It's a vision that Jesus is still, that Jesus is still leaning into by his spirit today. His vision is the reason why we're here. We're here because Jesus has a vision. He has a vision for this church. He has a vision for the church in in this city. And now we've we've, we've studied the church. I've I've tried to make sure over the last number of years that we've spent quite a bit of time studying the nature, the purpose, the call of the church. Like we've we've gone through 1 Timothy and we've seen that the church is a household of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Our world needs truth. Our world needs truth desperately. Desperately. Truth in love. The church is the household of God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. We, we've studied 1 Corinthians and seen that the church is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Both individually, us individually, and together corporately are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we've seen that the church is the body of Jesus. And every single one of us in the church have spiritual gifts and a part to play in the body. So the body can work well and, and right and be healthy. But, but as we head into a brand new season together, and I, I, I really do love these, um, like just these little 
marks on the calendar, like the Sunday after Labor Day. It's just like we come back into the fall. We call it launch Sunday. It's silly, but like it's, it's, it's really just like it's a new season for us. And, I, we, and we pray for months and months. And I pray for, I've probably been praying for a good four months lead up to today. Like, Lord, what do you want to say on that specific Sunday to your church? Because it feels like a fresh season. And as we head into a new season, I think there are two things specifically that Jesus' spirit wants us, the church of Jesus, in this place to lean into together. And, and it really, um, I'll, I'll show you those two things in a minute. They're, they're quite practical. They require a response of faith from 100% of us if we're going to lean into Jesus' vision. But, but it really all comes down to a single word that, that we see in Scripture a lot. And, we, and if you've read the Bible before, you've seen it uh, in, in the New Testament, the Gospels, and throughout the New Testament letters. We read it three times already in the text today, Acts 6, 1 to 7. This word's been repeated Three times. Let me show you. In Acts 6, uh, verse 1, and Acts 6, verse 7, we aren't just told that the church grew. We aren't told that the church grew, increased, and multiplied. No, it says specifically the disciples were increasing in number. And the number of the disciples Multiplied. This, this word disciple is a really, really important word. It, it's the word methetes, and it means student, but not student like if you imagine like sitting in a classroom, a university class or whatever, where you just like sit and, and you listen to the ideas of a professor. That's not what this word means. No, a methetes, this is a pupil. This is a, a mentoree. This is somebody who, who would leave what they used to, the life they used to live behind to follow in the footsteps of another. So a math they taste would follow a, a, a rabbi or a, or a philosopher or a guru and they would relearn how to live. That's what it means to be a disciple. That's what we see in Jesus' 12 disciples who are now, well, 11 of them are, are now the 12 in Acts, 11 plus 1. They're now the 12 in Acts, and they're, and they're leading the church. These were the original 12 disciples of Jesus. They, they were the ones who, when Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, or he walked by the tax collector's booth, or he's walking through these rural areas, and he would call these disciples to him. He chose them. He chose them. And he called them. And when they heard the call, something happened within them. And, and, and without, understand, without understanding almost very much at all, they left their old lives behind and they moved to follow Jesus. He was now master. The Holy Spirit, through the church, wants to set slaves to Satan, sin, and death free in our city. And when slaves to Satan, sin, and death are set free, they're not set free to now worship themselves. That's the same lostness as before. They're now set free to come under the lordship, under the mastery of Jesus, to become a disciple. They're set free to leave the boats behind, to leave the other things, and, and now follow Jesus as a mathetes, a, a pupil, an apprentice, a learner, a disciple. Like, like discipleship, church, is gritty stuff. This is not intellectual primarily or only. This is not spiritual primarily or only or even emotional. This is like gritty, on the ground, new rhythms, new routines, new schedule, new decisions, new priorities stuff. This is other people don't understand you stuff. This is, it looks like you're going in all the wrong direction stuff, but you know you need to follow Jesus. You're, you're trusting him stuff. What we see in Acts is that the true church is present wherever a community of people are together, together, giving themselves up to live as disciples of Jesus. The true church is present wherever a community of people are together denying themselves to be disciples of Jesus. The true church 
is present where the disciples of Jesus come together. The disciples of Jesus. Discipleship of Jesus is a very high calling. When I say high, I don't mean complicated. It's made for children. But high as in profoundly, profoundly significant, profoundly purposeful, profoundly important. There is nothing more important in this world than that God has planted his church here. That God has made disciples here. Jesus talks about it like he is a vine in the upper room discourse. He's a vine and his disciples are the branches. And he says those who abide in him, and those who, those who stay with him, remain with him, stay attached to him, means follow him. Don't get distracted by the other pursuits, the other false gods, your own flesh and appetite and desires, but, but stay walking after Jesus, your new master, your Lord God and King, the one who tells you what to do and you obey him in faith. Like to abide in him means that, that you as a branch will bear fruit. You know, a branch doesn't strain and strive and work really hard to earn its grape. It just has to be a branch. It just has to stay in the vine. And as it does, the grapes, and I love that Jesus took this image. You know, they understood vines and branches and grapes and wine. They understood the good fruit of the vine. And Jesus has planted his church, his disciples in this city to bear fruit, good fruit. Jesus has a vision for his church and that vision includes the heart of his father, which Jesus said his desire is for us is that we bear much fruit. The disciples left everything to follow Jesus and it's why they struggled so hard when Jesus said he would leave them. They were disciples. They were disciples. They need their master. And then Jesus said, no, no, it's better that I go because I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. And now what we see in Acts is the church is 5,000 and growing rapidly. Not just 12. 5,000 and growing. There is, church, there is now no limit. There's no limit to who can be a disciple of Jesus. There's no limit. There's a very real limit to how many people you can disciple. There's no limit to how many people the Holy Spirit can lead and disciple and train and equip and convict and change and transform and gift and power. I mean, I mean, look at what we're seeing in, in, the, in Acts 6, right, as we, open, as we open this chapter. I mean, do you want to see this in Vancouver? Like, do, do you want to see this in our city? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the pressure's increasing? Don't look at the pressure. The chaos is increasing. Don't get lost in the chaos or the insanity of the world. Don't get, don't get fixated on that stuff. Don't get distracted by that stuff. Look in the eyes of Jesus. He has a vision for his church and he's more powerful than anything else we could ever imagine. And his spirit is here right now. So, so, so why, I'm gonna just stop you there from clapping. It gets better. So why do we not see more? Why do we not see more? That's not worth a clap. <laughs> I'm calling you clappers out. I encourage you a lot, but you know, you gotta clap for the right thing. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> That's just my opinion, you can disregard it. Why do we not see more? I, 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 I think, I think it goes back to what we, what we studied earlier in Acts, in Acts chapter two, when we read like, so the Holy Spirit is poured out on, on the church and then what do the people do in response? We're told in Acts 2.42 that they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to God's priorities for them. Remember, 
they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. And there are two specific aspects to this that I believe the Spirit is just saying, hey, don't leave the uproom discourse until you guys commit yourselves, surrender yourselves to, to two of the main themes we've seen there. The, the things that I think the Holy Spirit is calling us into as a church in this next season in a fresh way. I'll put them on the screen for you. It's prayer. And it's our relationships with each other. So, so in, in the upper room, in the upper room, Jesus has repeated these words with his disciples over and over and over again. He, he, he has said this, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, he said, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Jesus said, truly, truly. That means this is a promise. That means this is more, be- this is foundational bedrock for your entire life. This will never let you down. This is a guarantee promise from the lips of God himself. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And a couple weeks ago, as we worked through the, the, the upper room discourse, we, we heard Jesus say that this specific era that we are living in now, like this era of the church, this era is meant to be uniquely marked in the grand scheme of eternity, by, by, uniquely by an asking and receiving church. We are here in this era of eternity this part of God's grand design and plan to restore all things. And our job is to be an asking and receiving church. Jesus has a vision for his church, and even though he doesn't need us, his vision includes moving in response to our asking. Like, I don't know why. That seems like a real frustrating way to put your vision together but it's his vision and he's waiting for an asking church why don't we see more in this city are you asking like are you asking I mean think about the way that Jesus taught us to ask like with persistence Keep going to him. Keep asking for what you know he wants. Like, have, have, have his vision become our vision? Do we, do we desire, like, when we wake up in the morning, do we fall on our faces and ask, like, Lord, build your church. This world, this world is going to hell. Jesus, save us. Like, use me, Lord. Like, save us. Things are falling apart. It is getting so dark. It is scary out there, Lord. People are afraid of each other. They're, they're hating each other. I mean, the amount of murders, like the murders that just took place like last couple weeks, just right here downtown. We had an elder meeting on Thursday night. We walk out. We couldn't leave because there's a, the, the bomb threat right here on Homer Street. And they have to detonate this package. Everybody's just so afraid. Is the church asking or, or like if we went home today, like if you met Jesus today, like if you're walking home and just hit by a car, something weird happened, you're gone today, and, and you're face to face with Jesus, like would he be able to say, like if you, would you say to him, Jesus, why didn't you mourn? Would he respond to you like, you never asked me. Like if life was over today, would your life have been a life of abiding in Jesus and asking? Would it have been a life of discipleship? Or are you just trying to protect yourself here? Are you just trying to make yourself safe and secure and comfortable here? Are you more concerned with your legacy or with the legacy of Jesus? Are you more concerned about your legacy or that the lamb would have the reward of his suffering? Because a disciple who follows Jesus, like we come under his lordship, under his mastery, it means we also come under his heart and his desires and his burdens, and we let them shape us. And oh my goodness, like we're all so far from this, especially me, but we, we keep on going back to Jesus in confession and repentance. We keep on growing in him. The 
if we're meant to ask according to the heart and the will and the burdens of Jesus, I mean, it begs a question, like, what does Jesus want? What does he want? Let me take a run at it. First of all, based on our text today, um, the verses that bookend our text in Acts 6, I think it's very safe to say Jesus wants a growing church. He wants, can I say it this way? It's going to sound a little bit crass, and let's just not worry about it. Jesus wants a bigger church. Sometimes I feel like Christians get so obsessed with, we just want a small church. And, you know, a lot of people leave the church they consider this church is too big, so they go to a small church, and that church gets too big, and they leave that one and find a smaller church, and it's like they're always pursuing a smaller church, but Jesus is pursuing a bigger church. Like, the Apostle Peter tells us that the only reason Jesus has not returned yet is because he's waiting for more people to come into his family. We have, do you know how many seats we have in this building? We have, we, have, we have two gatherings right now, right? Because if we go to one gathering, it's too full. We're not hospitable. If we go to one gathering, we can't take care of all the kids we have downstairs. So we're, we're at two right now. That means between two services, if we had all the seats in, like there's a couple more seats we could put in here. There's 3,600 seats. That's just two. We could do more gatherings. Like what, what I'm saying is why have we been put here? We've not all been put here so we have an extra seat for our coat. We're, we're put here because the need in this city is so Great, but we need the church, we need the disciples of Jesus to catch the heart and the burdens and the love of Jesus and actually go out there and share the gospel. Go out there and let people see your joy, let them see your peace and your life. Go out there and just follow Jesus, just stay with Jesus, just be a branch and you will produce fruit. And so here's what we're going to do. I, I, I believe very, very firmly, like, I, I, this conviction, it has been growing and is continuing to accelerate in me that the reason I exist, at least in this part of my life, to be here now and in this place, is I want to be part of building the church in this city. I want, I want to be used, and I don't mean this local church, I mean the church in this city. I want to support and build up the other churches in this city as much as this one. I just want to see Jesus I just want to see Jesus' church in this city come alive. I believe that's why we've been placed here, in, in this building, in the center of the downtown core. I, I believe it's the reason why we're here. So this is what we're going to do. Here's where this one gets practical. Over, over the next, so, so, so Jesus tells us to ask in his name, and he promises that we will receive what we ask for. Asking in his name means asking according to his will. So it means this. If we as a church, all together, as disciples of Jesus, begin asking for the things that he wants to see in his church, they will happen. I just, like, I just want to stop there for a second. Like, they will happen. So if we begin asking for the church to be holy... If we begin asking for the church to be unified and for us to love each other, if we begin asking for the church to be like a beacon of light in Vancouver, for, for us to finally walk in our own inheritance and so that the people around us would see and taste and eat the good fruit of Jesus' branches, if we begin asking for more lost people to come to Jesus than we've ever seen before and more Christians to be discipled to maturity, he will give us what we're asking for. So this is what we've done. We've, my, my, my wife, uh, Melissa, she oversees uh, prayer and renewal ministries just part-time in this season. And, and what we've done over the course of the summer is we've gone and approached uh, five different churches just, just downtown, just starting downtown. We obviously have a lot more. The church is much bigger, but just five churches downtown, and we've asked them, how can we pray for you? And, and we've compiled those things, we put them together, we've taken five different themes that we know that Jesus wants in his church, holiness, uh, evangelism, different things, and we've put those things all together and, and, and have packaged it into a six-week prayer initiative for us as a body, which begins uh, next week. So I'm going to throw a QR code up on the screen here for you where you can download uh, or just grab your, the prayer guide. I'm going to ask you all to grab your phone right now. I don't like asking you to get your phone uh, 
during this time, but grab it and, and, and would you scan this QR code? We need 100% of the people who call this church home to pray with us for the church in Vancouver. Every single week, starting next Sunday, uh, we're gonna come up here, we're gonna say, hey, so for example, this week we're praying for Coastal or The Way or First Baptist or Church Untitled or St. Pete's. And we're gonna come up here and we're gonna pray specifically for the request of that church. And then we're gonna pray over the church in the city as a whole. And we are gonna ask. And then that, that guide is there so you can, through your days, each and every day, with your families, in your gospel communities, so that you can set this time aside and just pray for the church. If we ask in Jesus' name, he will give us what we're asking for. So starting next Sunday, uh, and, and then, and we're not just, and I, I meet with the elders just last week, and I asked them if they thought it was good to share this with you. I, we think it is. We don't normally talk about the giving that we do and whatever, especially in this context, but we felt like it, miraculously we came to the end of last year's fiscal and we ended up with a surplus. Ridiculous. And so the first thing, yeah, um, yeah, that is, that was a miracle. That was an absolute miracle and I didn't even think it could happen. We were 800,000 behind with six weeks to go and we ended up with a surplus. It was just the hand of God moving through you, the church. I'm, yeah. But, but the first thing we're doing with the surplus is we're tithing to the church in Vancouver. So 10% 10, 10 of that surplus is going to these churches. So we're just cutting nice round checks because we don't, church, and I really want you to hear this. I really want you to hear this. We are really are for the church in this city. Last Saturday, Missy and I were invited by Dave and Cheryl Coop of Coastal to go celebrate with that whole group the 30th anniversary of Coastal. And it was like such a magnificent time. And like the Lord is doing something in the churches. Like, and we don't want to just pray for them. We want to support them. We want to see the church in this city built up and growing. And so that's the first thing, the prayer initiative. This, what we're talking about today requires a response of faith. And faith without works is dead. So if you know that God would have us pray for the church, I'm inviting you into this prayer with us as a church over the next six weeks starting uh, next Sunday. Okay. We're called to prayer. We're also called to each other. I, I believe the Spirit wants to, in this next season, bring relational health and healing to the church. This is... This is like a bigger miracle than the money coming in, right? Relational health. Like the, the, the washing away of bitterness and envy and resentment in his church. The, the wiping clean, the washing away of hatred and broken relationships even in annoyances of certain kind. We're back in Acts until Advent. And to understand what we're going to see, you have to know that the church is a communal reality. Jesus' vision for his church wasn't just individual disciples praying. It was individual disciples together denying themselves together following him. There, there is a kind of relationship that Jesus wants us to have with each other that we have no framework for in the world. The closest thing we have is family. But we know from scripture that the bonds we have as Jesus people are even, even closer than that. We're not, we're not bonded by our own biological blood. We're bonded by the blood of Jesus. And, and so when Jesus prayed his prayer, the high priestly prayer, which Lord willing we'll get to early in 2025, when he prayed the high priestly prayer, what did he pray for? He prayed for our oneness. That we would have the same life together that he has with the Father. That we would have that kind of closeness. There is no biblical context for a disciple of Jesus to walk alone in a place where the church exists. 
Like if you've been sent out to a place where there are no other Christians and you're a lone missionary, we'll give you an exception. But every word of every New Testament book, letter, is written into the context of Christian community. Disciples of Jesus walking after him together. If you are outside of that, if you do not have people in your life that you are intentionally walking after Jesus with, together with, you are outside the context of the kind of discipleship Jesus calls you into. You have to have other Christians in your life with whom you are devoted to, let's put those four things up, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Really quickly, the apostles' teaching, being devoted together to the apostles' teaching, what does this mean? It means you need people with whom you learn to study the scriptures, And you learn to surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit to shape you after the heart of God. Being devoted to fellowship means you have people with whom you are devoted to caring for each other, taking care of each other, loving each other. You don't give up on each other when it becomes awkward and difficult and inconvenient. That's really where most of the discipleship begins. Devoted to the breaking of bread means we rhythmically with other people devote ourselves to remembering Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. We, we devote ourselves to a cruciform life. It means like a life shaped around taking up our own crosses and following Jesus. And being devoted to prayer means we have people in our lives with whom we, we intentionally pursue the presence and the will and the heart and the desires and the burdens of God. Have to have it. How many of us have to have this? 100%. If, if we are going to step into Jesus' vision for the church, we all have to have this. Now, today, like every launch Sunday, uh, we have our gospel communities. That's what we call these communities. We, we have them. There's several dozen people in this church who are once again opening their homes up for other people to come and have that kind of community with them in their space. Several dozen. Amazing. Not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. So what we're doing is we're, we're putting discipleship and gospel community Christian community in your hands and we're saying you have to find some people around you at least two and commit yourself with them to gospel community and we want to resource you support you but 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 we need you to step out and take and and step into an act of obedience an act of faith and what we're going to do is we're going to open up space here, as much space as we need. If we get 100% of the church responding to this, we will make space for 100% of the, church, of the current church. We're going we're gonna to begin, I, I believe it's September 22nd, uh, holding what we're calling Center GCs. If you don't have people like that, we're going to help you find people like that. There is space for everybody. And so we're going to run eight weeks of Center GCs here, You can register with a group of people. You can just come by yourself and we'll put you together with some people and we're gonna train you up in what this looks like. We're gonna help support you, resource you before we release you uh, to do this. And then we're gonna just keep doing that over and over and over and over again until 100% of this church has gospel community around them. So one more QR code for you. Can we throw that one up? And can you please scan this? We need 100% of the people in this body to be in gospel community. So if you already have it, great. If you already have people, you're devoted to those four things, wonderful. We'd love to know who you are. We'd love to send you like a weekly guide and resource you if we can, but you already have it, wonderful. Everybody else, we, we have to, we have to walk with one another. Loneliness is epidemic in our city. And Jesus has designed us for a kind of depth of relationship that, 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 we've, we, we've been, that, that we desperately need and our world is so incredibly hungry for. 
These gospel communities, by the way, are where you can invite your friends and neighbors into. We want you to invite them here, but we want you to invite them there. Like, we need to go into this city as the disciples of Jesus and ask him to increase and multiply and build his church. Band, you can come on up. Communion servers, you can, you can come on down too. We're, we're moving into uh, a, a new season as a body. And I, I, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to empower, like I said at the beginning, radical acts of faith. Radical acts of faith. Imagine we were a church who over that six weeks starting, I mean, you don't have to wait till the 15th. You can start early. But starting on the 15th for six weeks, just on our knees every day for the church. Like every, can you imagine the kind of delight that would bring to Jesus? And I'm telling, he will answer. He promised it. We know what he wants to see in the church. He's told us. Can you imagine a church where 100% of us, where we realize our ministry, the context of our discipleship is each other. Like, do not leave today. If you don't have somebody, if you know one person in this room, the only bond you need is the bond of loving Jesus and the bond of wanting to walk after Jesus. You don't need to be in the same socioeconomic bracket. You don't need to work in the same industry. You don't need to be the same age. Like, it doesn't matter if some of you have kids and some of you don't, single or married, it doesn't matter. The bond is Jesus. So if you need this, talk to some people about that. Tell them, hey, I'd like to be in a gospel community. And then when someone asks you, just do everything you can to say yes. Like, let's just begin there. I, I know that uh, we need prayer to take the kind of steps of discipleship that Jesus is calling us into. So we'll have a prayer team here in just a minute, but we're gonna receive communion. And this is the moment where the spirit, we've, we've sat under the word, you've discerned what's just Matt and what's actually God saying through his word. You've discerned that and now we obey what we know is from God. We come under it as authoritative. I'm not authoritative, this is authoritative. We come under it now and we take communion. And in communion, we confess. We confess where we haven't lived in light of these things, where we've been less than diligent, faithful disciples. We confess that. We confess it openly. We confess it freely. We confess it with no guilt and no shame whatsoever, no condemnation. And then we repent and we turn back to Jesus. And we say, okay, I want your vision for my life. I want to be part of your vision for your church. So communion service, come on up. I want you to just take your places right now. I want people to see you. I'm going to pray. Uh, and, then, and then we're going we're gonna to worship. So Father, I just, we thank you, Lord, for, for this time together. And Spirit, we invite your work as we sing. We invite your work as we remember Jesus with the bread and the wine. We invite your work, Lord, because the, the foundation of our confidence, the foundation of our asking, Jesus, it's your life, death, and resurrection. It's your promise to return. We put our trust in you, Lord. And we turn from the lives we used to live and we, we live now in you. In you we live and move and have our being. In you we come alive. And Lord, we remember that your word says, we remember that you said in the Upper Room Discourse, Lord, you said all these things that our joy may be full. You want the joy of your church, the life of your church. So we ask, Lord, big fruit in this season, like lots of grapes on the branches, big, huge bundles of them, Lord, and that, that it would be so good for us and so good for the world.
fullness of joy, we ask it as we go into this time, Jesus, and commit ourselves once again to following you as your disciples. We love you. It's in your name we ask. Amen.